Welcome everyone, I'm Penny Lewis, the Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. This is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By collaborating on the webinars, we expand the reach of our regional programs across the country. If you're not familiar with the organizations, they're largely nonprofit and volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association <coughs> Sustainability Committee, the Kansas City Native Plan Initiative, and Rescape California. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Rick Huffman. Mr. Huffman is principal and founder of Earth Design Inc., an environmental design and landscape architecture firm with over 30 years experience in landscape design, horticulture, bioengineering, and ecology. Mr. Huffman has particular expertise in native plants as they occur in natural models. As founder and past president of the South Carolina Native Plant Society, he has brought awareness of these natural natural models to the public through presentations and workshops. Mr. Huffman has a strong commitment to education and has worked with local schools and conducted numerous environmental education workshops. Mr. Huffman has received numerous awards for his commitment to education and conservation, including the Governor's Award for Environmental Awareness. Mr. Huffman is a member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and is active in the U.S. Green Building Council. Welcome, Mr. Huffman. Thank you. Thank you, Penny, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone. We're glad to be here. So I want to start our program off today, and I want to talk about, um, we've got a great program for us today. Um, so uh, so to, our title of our talk today is, is Understanding the Human Connection to Our Planet, uh, Biodiversity, Native Plants, and Applied ecological uh, system. So, uh, so let's get started and talk about uh, get through the program. And I hope you everyone enjoys it. And I'm looking forward to doing it. So, uh, I always like to start off with uh, a, a quote, and I call it reflections and connections. And so, uh, and to start off with, I like to introduce uh, Aldo Leopold and the Land Ethic, uh, which is part of his book, A Sand County Almanac. Uh, and if you haven't read this book or seen this book, I think it's well worth it. Uh, it's a very expensive book. I think it's seven dollars or eight dollars at Barnes and Noble. Uh, but uh, but out of little pole to find something we call land ethics. And what does land ethics mean? It simply enlarges the boundaries of community of soil, water, plants, and animals are collectively the land. And so, in my opinion, uh, we have values and we have ethics for a lot of things, but. Uh, I think redefining our values for our land uh, as it is rather than what it can be is something that uh, we always strive to get people to think about and, uh, and understand. And then E.O. Wilson uh, is a great uh, conservation uh, ecologist. He's an entomologist by trade, but he's written many books about uh, environment and where we stand in our uh, uh, discourse in uh, the world. Uh, but he wrote that does man have the capacity to save life on the planet? And then, uh, and then Chief Seattle wrote uh, our president letters back in the 1800s. Uh, and he wrote that man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. And whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. So it's with this reflection and connection that we, uh, we take our, the, the, uh, our landscapes and our, and our view of landscapes uh, and how we perform in our landscapes. Uh, and we take this as part of our mission. Uh, we call it our value system. So um, our design philosophy is pretty simple. It, just, it influences sustainable practical thoughts of the transformation of society's understanding of the role of landscape in maintaining and supporting a healthy environment. And that sounds uh, like we have something we all should strive for. Uh, but, uh, but it's through the education that we bring these intrinsic values and obligations associated with blending the social, environmental, and the economical elements together in a singularly uh, and unique way. And so again, with the, thing, the previous slide of reflection connection, we find that uh, we are striving to meet the development needs of the present without compromising the bills of the future generations uh, to meet their own needs. 
So this is kind of a little tone setter here. The first part of the presentation is really kind of setting this philosophy and this tone and getting us to look and see things maybe from a different perspective uh, than we maybe otherwise when we think about just the landscape. Um, so uh, the next slide is about biodiversity. It's about life and life connections. And we hear the word sustainability, we hear life connections or biodiversity a lot. And so those words kind of mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people perhaps, but kind of bring it down here and kind of give some definition. But uh, this slide right here, you can see lots of things in it, lots of connections. Uh, and so I think uh, when you look at biodiversity, I like to think about it is you cannot touch one thing in the natural world without touching it all. And uh, so that's just the way it works. It's all about connections. It's about cycles. It's about recycling. It's about consumers and producers. Uh, so it's about how all these things work and layer themselves together that form our biosphere uh, and that uh, it summarizes the word uh, biodiversity. So here are a few definitions uh, of biodiversity, uh, more, more formally or more uh, written there. Uh, but, uh, but biodiversity is about the variability of living organisms, uh, terrestrial, marine, marine, aquatic systems, and how they all again overlap and interact, work together. Uh, this vast array of ecosystems, ecosystem services, as we call it, the new term is out there, ecosystem services, uh, that serves the biodiversity uh, that we all that are, is, uh, rely on and uh, as far as our everyday uh, livability. And it is important that we understand biodiversity, uh, not just in the natural world and uh, untouched, but also in the human managed world in our natural ecosystem that we design in all of our landscapes. And then and lastly, we, the decisions that we make that influences biodiversity into the well-being of self and untold members of our fellow biotic systems. Again, really keeping in tune with the land ethic that we started off with in this program. So, uh, you know, E.O. Wilson, again, I just want to kind of finish up the quotes and kind of set in the tone here a bit with uh, E.O. Wilson, you know, and he thought that we should uh, view biodiversity as a precious thing and we should save every scrap of it because in some ways we are flying blind because we only have learned so little about really how things work and how things are connected and we're all still learning uh, in this process. So uh, this slide here is a very simple slide, uh, a very simple uh, decomposing rotting log in a forest uh, where you have lichens and mosses and all things tropic, uh, breaking things down, changing things, changing logs into soil. Uh, you can see in the slide there the flowering of the uh, polystrictium communis, which is the hair cap moss. Uh, that is, uh, again, a little uh, moss that's flowering there. It's hard to see the flowers, but you can see those there and of course the, just a, a web of things there and the part of this slide is to also to understand that you know uh, the connections uh, biodiversity wise sometimes we're talking about things seen and unseen we're thinking about the small things the things that make the things uh, all of our planet and all of our native land all of our landscape work the things that we don't see and so uh and and small things and if we think about it in the tropic levels. So, and our landscapes uh, that we design and we create, we're understanding these connections and the tropic levels that they support. And so these beautiful flowers, I'm gonna show you a series of beautiful scenery and flowers that again help define uh, how we draw inspiration of form and function, cycles and processes from our native landscapes and our native plants. Uh, let's think about it. Native plants define us as people. They define us as who we are and our place in the world. And so we see these beautiful pictures of beautiful plants and the wildlife connections that are so integral and important to our, uh, make our uh, natural worlds work, but also our, uh, our built landscapes as well. And so here we can see the wonderful Monarda, the bee bomb, so attractive to hummingbirds and butterflies and uh, it's got the great uh, smell uh, fragrance to it as well and so um, this is just a nice one of our nice native plants that uh, uh, again the form and function of it but again it goes back to how things are connected 
And uh, so we look for the little guys. How are we supporting these trophic levels within our landscapes to support these guys? And because these are the guys we're working for uh, in, in our processes, in our designs. Uh, so uh, we, we we talked about wildlife, wildlife habitat. Uh, would you know it if you saw it? Would you know it biodiversity if you saw it? And can you put your hands on it? And can you see it? Can you touch it? Can you feel it? Can you smell it? And so when you see this right here, this is a this guy transforms into this guy, and uh, so spotbush swallowtail. And uh, so you know the biomimicry is the things that we're talking about. So we're looking at how nature uh, mimics. Uh, systems and things. So here's a, a pillow caterpillar, uh, you know, mimicry, uh, you know, and so camouflage. And so again, it's part of that system and part of that mimicry uh, that we're modeling ourselves after. And so again, these beautiful pictures, these beautiful connections of wildlife and plants and time and space and people. And here's our beautiful Gulf Coast literary, uh, fritillary uh, butterfly. Uh, munching on a eucatorium, a white bone set. And uh, so again, these connections are also important. Uh, and then let's not forget the fungal world. And so, you know, this is a Ganoderma uh, uh, Nangisi or Rishi fungi. And this is, we found this locally abundant here in our woods down here in South Carolina. And uh, so again, this is one of the leading guys out there for anti-cancer uh, research. And so uh, this is, Again, one of our fungal components. And, you know, at Earth Design, uh, years ago, we hired a mycologist to come work for us. And and we were already using a lot of fungi as, as, as substitution for fertilizers. Um, but uh, he came in and worked with us. And now we have a, a, a host of about 30 or 40 fungi uh, that we use in our landscape to add to the trophic level of our landscapes. And so all these things, seen and unseen, small and large, uh, we take into account and we uh, include it in our thinking in our landscapes. And so small things like this uh, crown tip coral uh, are the British soldiers that you see on the right. You know, these are again, uh, things that we look for, the small things, the things that are seen and unseen. And like this Cladonia rangifera, this is called reindeer moss. And this rain moth is everywhere in our landscape. But how many people actually slow down or take the time to stop and look at it? And uh, and even on the sunny, on the driest of dry or droughts that we have particularly, you can take this and you can put your hand underneath it and it's always wet, no matter how dry it is. So these are again, part of things that we look for and things that we adopt in our landscape. So we talked a lot about the little small things and looked at some uh, different things here, but let's look span out and step back a little bit. And let's look at, you know, some of the bigger things that uh, inspire us and bring home our native landscapes. And this is one of our favorites here. This is Amelanchia uh, Levaeus or Shablo or Service Ferry. Uh, this is up on taken up on the Blue Ridge Parkway, not far from my home. And uh, so again, that right week, that right time of year, the sad Shablo or Service Ferry, is such a wonderful addition to any landscape. But again, we look at the inspirational models here. Look at this 40-acre fern glade that we find in our local woods here. And again, these are the places that we go and we look and we draw the inspiration to which perform uh, our landscape designs and uh, and accordingly. So uh, here you got uh, some another great pictures of Rhododendron baseii and the Trillium undulatum, or painted Trillium. And again, look at the form and the function of these plants. And, uh, and again, just these beautiful pictures of these beautiful plants. And all these things are out there for us to take advantage of in our native landscapes and the way we design and we build our systems. Uh, Jack in the Pulpit, we love Jack in the Pulpit, a uh, wet plant uh, that we love so much. And then, of course, our beautiful native today is in. Uh, that we have a lot of species of native they, they is now available to us and uh, you know they're so popular now uh, the native plant society we had a plant cell last year we sold 300 native azaleas in two hours and uh, and so the popularity of native azaleas has grown and continuing to grow and they're such a beautiful addition to our landscapes and we'll show some pictures of some in a landscape shortly um, 
another data plant that I just absolutely love. And I just love the form and function of this. I love the way it trembles with the slightest little breeze. And it's flowers in February. Uh, so down here in the south. So uh, Rue Anemone is just a really beautiful plant. And just again, love the, the photo here that captures the essence of that plant. Uh, so this plant's pretty hard to take a photo of because uh, it's, uh, it's always moving. Other plants that we tend to like and love is the mountain ash. Uh, this plant should be in the nursery trade. It should be sold. And we're working with vendors now to make this plant available uh, for consumers. And then, of course, bloodroot is always part of our woodland uh, spring ephemerals that we have. And, of course, another species of rue anemone is there up on the upper right. But, uh, you know, landscapes is about viewing our landscape from a, a time and place, geological time and place. So this pretty scene that we have here, this is a local area here in uh, our neck of the woods in South Carolina. And again, that we're so blessed here uh, that we have this to draw inspiration from uh, about time and space and geology. You know, when we look at our landscapes, whether you're in an urban setting or, you know, a rural setting or suburbia, you know, if we look at our landscape from a historical perspective and understand what was here 250 years ago, what was it like? What were the plant communities uh, that belong here? And uh, so are belonged here at once in a time. So I think it's always important to understand where we are and where we are in time and place. And so we take that into account when we think about landscape ecology. And so it begins on the land, it begins on a watershed perspective, you know, and thinking about we all live in a watershed. And so nobody gets out of not living in a watershed. And you think about every drop of water, where it hits and where it winds up and where it and what it, what it carries along the way. And so uh, when we look at this beautiful scene of a beautiful mountain scene with uh, a watershed after watershed after watershed, uh, we get a sense of perspective, and, and that's really what we're talking about here is a lens from which we perceive and perceive the world and that perspective. So understanding what a watershed is. I give a lot of public talks, and I've heard people, you know, stand up and say, well, I don't live in one of those watersheds. And well, what is a watershed? And can you define a watershed? And would you know a watershed if you saw it? And uh, most people don't really get that concept of watersheds and what it is and why it's important that we work with and protect our watersheds. And uh, at Earth Design, uh, we focus our designs on water quality, water quality, but we also focus on a watershed perspective. Where is each project uh, located within the watershed and what is its impact and or its value uh, in that watershed? And so, uh, and from all these things that we've talked about so far, this is where we get to where we, we design and we create landscapes that reflect those values uh, that we just talked about, from watershed protection to uh, geological time and place, um, but also taking advantage of natural plant communities and basically applying plant communities uh, on the landscape. So it's one thing to think about native, land, native plants uh, per se, but the goal is, is to apply them in plant communities because it's the community of things that work well together, that form those trophic levels, and work those little guys uh, that we were talking about earlier. And so here you can see some beautiful landscapes, again, where we've designed some simplicity. And sometimes they don't have to be very complex landscapes to be very, uh, very effective. And here where we, we have used a, a wonderful ground cover, which we'll talk a little bit more about that later, called Green and Gold. Uh, with some rhododendron, and of course you can see those beautiful native azaleas uh, flowering in the background. And this landscape is 20 plus years old, and uh, so and this is how it's easy, so easily maintain it. And uh, and the client that uh, is still there with us after 20 years uh, just loves their landscape, and it's a very minimum upkeep, very minimal care. But again, we come back to this nice woodland scene where we see these beautiful fall flower and plants in here and the ferns and just the tapestry of things that we wanted to capture within this project. Uh, here we can see the use of native azaleas and then you can see the shadow of the service berry in the background there, along with Bobagilla, uh, I think is in that slide. 
Uh, but there's that beautiful Piedmont azalea and the Florida orange, uh, orange red Florida azalea uh, in the background. And again, you know, a lot of times when people think of these native azaleas, uh, they want to put them in the shade, but they really do better, sometimes flower much better and perform better in sun. Here you can see where these native azaleas are not in the shade, but they're in the full sun. And you can see how they filled out over time and made really wonderful specimens. And our client, again, a long-term client here, uh, has worked with, we've worked with, and just loves her native azaleas and things that we've done for her. And again, it's about water quality and water quantity issues. Here's a riparian buffer that we install for the um, Table Rock Visitors, uh, the South Carolina Parks Recreation Tourism uh, Visitor Center on uh, beautiful Scenic Highway 11. Uh, this is the riparian buffer that we installed or designed for them and they installed it. Uh, that has been there for again close to 17 or 18 years and this riparian buffer is protecting uh, the water quality within that watershed. But ultimately it comes back to understanding about ecological habitat restoration and mimicry. We, what we like to do and what we strive to do is mimic ecosystems and plant communities specifically. And plants again define those ecosystems, those plant communities. So here you can see in the upper left where we have a granitic outcrop system, which we have locally uh, abundant down here in the south. Uh, but you can see the beautiful uh, tapestry and drifts of color and uh, things that working through there. That's in the upper left. And then on the right, you see the, uh, the mountain waterfall uh, with the woods, et cetera. And when people look at that, they say, well, plant communities, habitat restoration, how does all this apply? And we're going to talk about that. But the plant community concept here, when you see that picture on the upper right, the plant community uh, that's really the coolest is the plant community that you can't see. It's the plant community on the face of that waterfall. Uh, and that plant community is a brophyte community uh, of liverworts and lichens and moss. And stuff. So it's very cool to look at and understand, but also understand the role of those plants and how they help us clean our water. And uh, so, and then it comes to the riparian buffers down on the left, it's the same uh, uh, area that I showed you in the previous slide. A little bit more of a look toward the uh, uh, the riparian prairie the buffer that we set up there, and you can see the beautiful scenery of Table Rock is, uh, in the background. And then lastly, down on the right, you see the pine flatwoods, which is down in the low country of South Carolina, and these are fire maintained uh, plant communities there. Uh, you know, and you can see the, the, the carnivorous pitcher plants there, and again, there's a lot of terrestrial orchids in there as well. And again, just part of this uh, story to be told here about uh, restoration and biomimicry. And it begins by understanding uh, succession and plant communities from a successional standpoint. And if you think about ecological landscaping, it really begins understanding ecological su successional, uh, plant succession. So when you clear off the land and you're starting over, well, that's going to want to recover back to an oak tree forest or some thereof. So it's going to want to succeed back to a certain level. So uh, we look at these early successional grasses and forbs. These are the guys that come in and that what we call a service pioneer species that pave the way for the next higher order or trophic level of plants to come in. So these grasses are so important in our bones and our systems. And here you can see in the upper left, you can see a, a mix of uh, little blue stem, split beard blue stem, uh, and uh, uh, bushy blue stem. And then the uh, upper right is uh, pink muley grass, uh, Muhlenbergia, which has become very popular uh, in our landscapes here because of that nice uh, plume of uh, smoky color uh, red there. Uh, and then the bottom left is uh, we see some plume grass, more uh, of the little blue stems working in there along with Indian grass. And then the right, uh, lower right hand side is a Danthonia, uh, a plant called silky oak grass. It's a spring flowering grass where the other ones are more fall, uh, late summer and fall. Uh, but again, you can see that nice black blonde color uh, in that landscape. And we've used those as ground cover because uh, the flower only lasts a few weeks and then when you mow it down, the grass part can serve as a nice lawn or a ground cover. But the role of grasses and what is the role of these grasses in our landscapes that hold everything together? So you can look at this slide right here and you can see what the fibrous root system that these plants possess and how they hold everything together. 
Uh, you think about the prairies of Midwest, upper Midwest, and uh, a lot of people don't really think about Southeast as being a prairie uh, biome, but we have those here, and we had those long before the prairies in the Midwest were there. Uh, so we can see the, the roots that go down very, very deep here. And uh, so they hold everything together. And also these native grasses, early successful things, uh, have high remedial quality, so they can help uh, filter and biofilter uh, our toxins that we impose upon our landscapes of water. So early successional grasses and forbs uh, are part of this mix, and this uh, we're still in this kind of a early successional uh, mode of talking in this talk. You can see some of the more uh, prettier flowering things that we have within this early successional uh, mode of, of choices for our landscapes, uh, from the baptisia up there on the blue plant on the left to the, uh, the butterfly weed up there in the middle, the orange flowers, to the liatris, the, the purple spiky fly up in the upper right. And of course, the golden rods are very uh, wonderful in our landscapes. And then of course, the bottom right is our uh, iron weed. So here's a mix of uh, wonderful flowering plants and all sort of role uh, in our early successional landscapes. Uh, some more, uh, some additional early successional uh, plants that we have here is blue-eyed grass, which is on the left. Uh, that plant is a great substitute for the ripe and those type of things in a border. Uh, or you can use them in a rain garden. They work very well in wet, semi-wet conditions, or they can take it bone dry. And a lot of times you'll have this plant in your lawn, uh, but not knowing it because you're mowing it. And uh, But if you let put your lawn mark for a little while in the early spring, you're amazed how many lawn weeds are actually very attractive. Uh, and then, of course, the beard tongue is the next plant there in the middle. Uh, pink to a purple plant, um, had a little tuft of hair on the lid of it there. Uh, you know, that's a, one of the pensmans are, we have the highest number of species of uh, this herbaceous perennial anywhere. Uh, so we had, I think, about over 200 species of this plant out there in the wilds across the United States. So it has a lot of species within that genera. Uh, and then the black-eyed Susan, of course, everyone knows that one. And our asters, which I feel like are the most some of the most underutilized native plants that we have within our plant palette. Uh, and this go cover some trees and shrubs. Uh, here we can see the upper left, we see uh, child Nathus virginicus, which is Grancy graybeard. Uh, you know, another common name for that's called fringe tree. Uh, this is a plant that, a tree that doesn't get more than about 12 or 15 feet tall. Uh, it's a very slow grower. It grows on these granitic outcrop systems. So it, it grows in a crack of a rock uh, but it takes hot, tough, dry conditions. It's not a large tree. It grows very slowly. And you can see the beautiful white flowers. And more importantly, for the trophic level of things that we're talking about, this seed is a, is a droop. Uh, has a lot of fat content, so it's great for the wildlife. Uh, the upper right is the beautyberry, Calicarpa americana. Uh, this plant is one of our favorite. It makes a large shrub, uh, but has these beautiful clusters of uh, magenta berries in the fall of the year. And again, one of our uh, wonderful, beautiful native plants there. Uh, the bottom left is sumac, and uh, sumac kind of gets a bad rep uh, sometimes. It kind of grows in uh, waste areas or roadsides. Uh, but how do they look in a landscape? If you can you imply these in a landscape? And you can see that beautiful fall color. They're a kind of three season plant for sure. And, uh, but they're not utilized very much in, in our landscapes, but we think that they should be. And we're working with growers and vendors now to get some cultivars out there that are working pretty nicely with that. Then the slide to the right is one that we don't see in our landscape ever, but I just want to point it out because it's such a, a great plant for wildlife and it's very historical uh, for us as well. It's Chickasaw plum. Uh, this is Prunus angustifolia. And if you have an area along the edge between your woods and an open area uh, that you just want to naturalize, this would be a good plant to choose from. Early successional flowering mixes. I mean, so you see all the diversity and things that we just showed you. And uh, this, uh, uh, you think about, well, I got to have a lot of space for this. Uh, here's an early successional flowering mix that's in a 10 by 10 foot area. <laughs> and uh, so it's not a large space, but look at the diversity that we have within this photograph. And you think about the trophic levels of wildlife that we're supporting, as well as the uh, what we call eye candy uh, for, the, for the consumer. So again, it's a beautiful landscape. So let's talk a little more about some other plants that we find in this moist, sunny trees and shrubs. Uh, the red maple to your left is uh, 
one we call the vagabond of plant communities because it lives in all of them. It lives in the wet, it lives in the dry, it lives on the top of the mountain, bottom of the mountain, and it lives across the entire United States of America. So that red maple, fast growing tree, great shade, uh, wonderful tree for wildlife as well. And then the shrub in the middle is called Itea virginicus. Uh, Virginia sweet spire is a common name for that. Uh, this is a plant that can, grows uh, naturally on streams and lakes, uh, lake shorelines and things, but it works anywhere in your landscape. It'll take it wet, it'll take it dry, it'll take it sunny, or it'll take it shady. So this plant will just about live anywhere you put it. Uh, and as I like to say, you can take a stick and beat it every day <laughs> and not kill it. Uh, so it's a great plant. And then the companion to the right is a summer sweet clethra. Uh, this one's called 16 candles. Uh, cultivar, uh, and we also have a straight species called ruby spice, and all of them are good, and all of them are very fragrant, have great fall color, and they're going, again, they support butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, so, again, sunny more flowering forbs, the yeah, upper left is a green-headed coneflower, uh, and the upper right is a beautiful hibiscus, uh, and these hibiscus, uh, even though sometimes uh, they list themselves as being wet wannabes, uh, they can take it fairly dry as well, and they have interesting foliage and these beautiful red uh, flowers. There's another species of this called Moschitos that has a more white uh, flower with a red center, uh, which are great. And then uh, the bottom right is the uh, is Joe Pie weed, uh, one of the Eupatoriums. Uh, all the Eupatoriums are great uh, host plants for your uh, butterflies, as well as nectar sources uh, in the summer and fall. Uh, and then, of course, beautiful cardinal flower down there on the left and lower left. And that plant uh, grows in creeks and margins along uh, areas. You can see it near water there. Uh, and anytime you have red flowers, you know you're going to be attracting hummingbirds. Uh, some of our shady woodland plants uh, that we have to look at and show. Uh, the upper left there is uh, one of the plants that made our neck of the woods uh, kind of famous. This is called Oconee Bell. Yes, and the Latin name is Shortia glacifolia, uh, and hence the name glaciofolia, which means it's, it's a glacial remnant. It was trapped here, and uh, this is the only place in the world that it's found. And uh, so uh, it made Andre Michaud uh, famous because uh, he, he discovered it. And uh, so uh, and it was lost to science for over 150 years until we rediscovered it about 30 years ago. Uh, and then the Indian pinks is on the upper right. Just love Indian pinks. Uh, it's called Spigelia marylandica, uh, Indian pinks, and it grows all along the eastern seaboard uh, and it has these beautiful red flowers with that yellow star. Uh, and it's fairly easy to grow. Uh, you know, you just have to, uh, I think, plant it late, late uh, maybe May, June, rather than trying to get in early, early in the fall. Uh, trilliums are great. We have great experience with trilliums. Trilliums grow all across our country, and people think well, they can they can be hard to grow, but you know, not really. It's just a matter of having the right organic matter in the soil and, again, taking advantage of some uh, minerals that may be in there. Uh, and then there's, um, of course, our beautiful blood root, which we showed you earlier. Uh, shady woodland plants, again, we kind of continue along the successional line of thinking here. Uh, we can see a beautiful columbine there. And this columbine serves a lot of ways. You can put it in planters. You can put it in lots of different things. And, it can be fairly aggressive. It will reseed uh, fairly aggressively, but uh, I've never found it to be a problem. Uh, and then the woodland flocks here, using phloxes. This flock, particularly Diricata, as a ground cover. This is called London Grove. And uh, so it's a great uh, addition to our woodland flat uh, ground covers. Uh, and then you have the Christmas fern on the right. And the Christmas fern is a no-brainer. Uh, you, you really don't even have to plant it. You can throw, literally throw it on top of the ground it will live. Uh, and this is one of my favorite groupings of plants of all the slides here. Uh, this is uh, a lot of people have experiences with shady areas where they can't grow anything, they can't grow grass, they have exposed tree roots, they got hurt, very acidic soils, etc. and struggle with it. But these three plants, you can use these three plants in combination uh, as ground covers and things that can uh, take those conditions. So the top left plant is green and gold. Chrysogonum virginianum, uh, and it is like the, probably the simplest plant you ever remember. It's called green and gold, and uh, this plant is available in a lot of mail order as well as nurseries. 
uh, and it uh, you saw the earlier slide where we showed you you it showed you that plant and landscape. Uh, and then the bottom right there is Crescent Iris, uh, and this plant only gets about two to three inches tall. It's a spring and femoral, so it comes up and does this whole life cycle before the leaves come off the trees. Uh, but just a, what a beautiful breath of spring when this plant comes up. Uh, and then uh, the bottom left is spiderwort. Again, spiderworts grow all over the United States. Uh, and so, uh, and these uh, it can be fairly aggressive with in these situations, like uh, shady areas. Uh, sometimes we like these plants to be aggressive because out to beat the weeds. Again, just to kind of show you some more of this love. We showed you this Zaya earlier, but uh, uh, but uh, the red buckeye to the upper right is one of our great buckeyes. We have several buckeyes. We have the bottle bush buckeye, painted buckeye, and then of course the red buckeye that you're seeing here, which is Astellus pavia. And uh, so uh, Mount Laurel on the lower right there, we have an abundance of Mount Laurel down in our neck of the woods, and it grows all along the eastern seaboard. Uh, so uh, you can see the Calmia, this Calmia latifolia is the Latin name for that. It likes a lot of magnesium, so we've, we've learned how to make this plant work better by understanding the soil chemistry uh, that makes it work and also the pH levels that we need. Uh, the bottom left is rhododendron, uh, Catopians, uh, and so uh, this one happens to be called Rosium elegans. And uh, so uh, the rhododendrons are a really great addition, evergreen addition to our landscapes uh, when we don't have a lot of evergreens. Uh, so, shady woodland plantings. This is an example of a. Of, well, this is one of my very first projects that we did 23 years ago, uh, where we wanted to replicate a plant community. And so uh, the client, I don't think, was really uh, was kind of we didn't she didn't know what she was done yet, and I wasn't sure either. <laughs> but uh, this is what we installed, and this is what it came out to be. So this is after three years, and uh, so uh, it really turned out beautiful. And, uh, and again, it's self-serving. And so each year it kind of it comes away and comes back. So that's what we like. Uh, so again, come back to look at some of these community models that we showed you earlier. I showed you that granite outcrop in the biomimicry slide. But here's a, a, a snapshot of one that we have locally here. But look at this Sedum smallia or this L4 pine. And you can see it in the landscape there. And uh, so what we've done is learn how to use these plant communities and apply these plant communities in such things like roof, roof gardens or, or rooftops. And so what does a mimic, uh, mimics a roof garden? Well, this granite outcrop. So we take these plant communities and we apply. So just like this right here. So you can see this is the plant community up on the upper left. And here you can see where we began to uh, build this plant community here at the South Lime Botanical Garden at Clemson University. And uh, so uh, that sedum has begun to come in now. It took a while for it to get there, but we've set up the habitat and this really began to come in really, really nice. And so again, we think about ecology and public landscapes. And so this is one of our projects that we did. And again, uh, in the, uh, for a, a county museum. And so we looked at that county museum and where it was located. And we looked at the county and we looked at the plant communities within that county. So we just didn't want to design any landscape. We wanted a landscape that reflected and told the story of the ecological history of the county. And so this is the landscape that we installed. And we wanted to combine both not only the natural community, but also the cultural aspects uh, that help shape uh, the county and the community. And of course, the museum and the reflection upon that. So you can see this beautiful landscape that we uh, designed and created here. Uh, we'll go back to that slide one second. Also notice the educational signs that we had in this landscape. We feel like every landscape has to be educational, and that is the key to understanding. So, uh, so here's a corporate landscape on the upper left. It's the same landscape as you can see, but you can see how it has evolved over time and on the different seasons. So. Uh, each season is different. The landscape changes with each season. This is a corporate landscape that we did for uh, in Greenville, South Carolina. And again, uh, this is about an eight to 10 acre uh, Piedmont Prairie uh, that we installed in here and designed and installed. And uh, the corporates uh, just love it. But they, first of all, they love it because they don't spend a lot of money uh, maintaining it. But secondarily, uh, ever, visitors from all across the world come here and, and they get a glimpse of what a Piedmont Prairie was like in South Carolina, maybe 250, 300 years ago. 
so here you can see another uh, ecological community landscape there on the left hand side. Uh, this is along a, a lake shoreline, which is the drinking serves as the drinking water for the community, and uh, and the, this community that were before this was there uh, was mowing grass right down to the edge and throwing fertilizer out willy nilly, and so we came in and uh, eliminated the grass and put in this uh, prairie, and uh, it's a little more flowery than you traditionally see on a prairie, but uh, again we had to reach for the aesthetics uh, to make it acceptable and uh, realizing that we can spoon food them over time. Uh, they're accepting uh, a more biome like this. And walking trails and bird boxes and educational signage, again, make it palatable to all the residents that live there. And then, of course, the slide on the right was a residential project that we did that had erosion, uh, big enough to put a Volkswagen in. And uh, so we stopped the erosion and we put in a diversity of native plants in there that uh, uh, very aesthetically uh, pleasing for the client that was very uh, very much rooted in more traditional landscapes. So uh, we were able to transform her view of landscapes forever in that we we're supporting the birds and the butterflies and the wildlife. And I guess we also think about not just beautiful landscapes, but how they function. And uh, we showed you those slide earlier, the grasses and how deep rooted they are. This was a site of a hillside on a lake. And you can see the steepness of that slope. The house, was on a geological fault and it was a, ready to fall into the lake. And so we installed these grasses in those deep, deep roots and saved the home and saved the, the slope from entering it, uh, falling into the lake. And so these grasses can not only be pretty, but they also can be very functional as far as holding things together and stopping erosion, or in this case, stopping the slough and entering it falling into the lake. So we're about three slides out from the end, so if you have questions that you need to get in, uh, please go ahead and get those questions in. We have just a couple more slides here. So, uh, But uh, again, this landscape was very pretty, and the client uh, was from Buffalo, New York. He absolutely loved it, and uh, so, uh, and you know, and you can see the grasses that we have in there and how pretty they are. And then lastly, this is one of our projects that we did for a, a local YMCA where they had huge stormwater issues and we took stormwater and we made it art. And uh, so this is a scene from our uh, uh, celebration there, a uh, dedication, if you will, uh, where the kids were out and they could uh, uh, put your hands uh, in the rain garden and, uh, and the bubbles were there for just uh, kind of fun. And uh, so it was a great day. A lot of people celebrating uh, the addition of this in the YMCA there. And again, not just doing something that's uh, beneficial there, but also how can we make it educational uh, for the public and our kids particularly. So this was a great project. And so we really enjoyed the opportunity to work with the YMCA on this. And we're still doing projects with this YMCA, uh, helping them address from uh, green roofs to stormwater, the ecological habitat restoration so they're adjoining a river a system as well. So we want to make sure they're good stewards. And lastly, this is my uh, last slide. So this is our company, Earth Design, uh, Landscape Architecture and Environmental Design. And this is our contact information here, both our uh, office number as well as my cell, personal cell number. And uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions uh, with the email or a call. And uh, we'd love to uh, help you if we can. And I want to thank Penny and ELA for having us here on, on this uh, program today. It's been a world of fun putting it together and collaborating on it. And uh, so hopefully uh, you have all gained a bit of insight and some, some, uh, to some pretty pictures about some pretty plants and maybe learn a few things as well. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rick. Lots of wonderful information. We have a few questions for you. What is your view of using cultivars versus straight species for restoration work? Well, that's a great question. Uh, if it's restoration work, we do not want to use cultivars, okay? If it's landscaping in someone's backyard or some public, you know, like a, a hotel or something like that, but if, it's, if we're going to say it's restoration, we want to try to use uh, local genotypes, first of all, and we don't and we don't use cultivars. Uh, or I think there's a term out now called native bars, and uh, I was at a talk yesterday and that came up, but uh, but when we're doing restoration and restoration ecology, like some of those projects that you saw, the visitor center and other things like that, 
We want to use as straight species and native uh, as close to the close uh, the genotypical plants as we can. Uh, and a good example of that is when we worked with the uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, down here in South Carolina years ago, uh, where uh, I helped uh, introduce a program with them, uh, introducing native grasses and prairie biome systems for erosion control and logging decks. And so immediately they wanted to go out and buy seed in the Midwest. And I said, no, we can't do that. We have to protect the genotypes here. And uh, so what we did there, uh, we uh, collected local genotype seeds and we wound up growing those things out and putting them back in the correct areas. So there is a sensitivity to that. When, uh, in, in, uh, in, there is a sensitivity to that, but I want to say that, you know, there are a lot of cultivars or native bars out there, if you will, when you're talking about a residential scale or more landscapey scale, and you're not trying to uh, depict it as restoration tr tr truly, then I think those things are uh, applicable. All right. When you're starting a project, do you use seed or plugs? And do you uh, start with both pioneer species and later successional species at the same time? Great question. So yes, we do use seeds and we do use plugs and we use gallon material uh, as well. So uh, so we use all, all of the above. Uh, sometimes projects we actually, we call it restoration. We go out and collect our own seeds. Uh, so we've done that as well and store the seed, clean the seed and do that type of thing. Uh, but, uh, but we do use the plugs. Uh, you know, we've got good vendors that we've recruited uh, work with us and trying to get keep our genotype local as well as our seed vendors uh, like Ernst Seed. Uh, we work with them to cultivate uh, Piedmont species of uh, cultivar uh, seed sources. Uh, I actually work with some local growers here, uh, people that had acreage and got them to the, uh, go into the seed production business, I guess, if you will, so we could have more local genotype. So uh, I'm active on those levels. but. And the second part of the question is, do, uh, do we, when we talk about early succession, do we add some of the later succession plants in there? And I, I, I'd say yes, that we do. And uh, so uh, you have to account for change in your landscape. You know, uh, if you have an early successional landscape, you know, to maintain the early successional per se is, you know, basically a cut, mow, or burn scenario uh, on a routine basis, uh, but not uh, like a weekly basis, but seasonally, I guess, or yearly. Uh, so what we want to do there is add some plants in there, like we showed you the fringe trees and those early to mid-successional plants. So there, we don't try to jump 30 years of succession instantly. We think that's it's, it's very difficult to get that happening because a lot of the later successionary trees, uh, when you put them out in wide open, hot, sunny spaces, they don't fare as well. So trying to jump 30 years of succession instantly is, can be problematic. Uh, but we do like to mix it in uh, there. And uh, always we think about the ecological edges where the woods meet the open uh, areas, early successional areas. Those zones are what we call ecotones. And those ecotones along those edges is where we want to use those uh, early to mid successional trees and shrubs like dogwood, service berry, sassafras, uh, and viburnums and hawthorns and things like that. They have a wild, have a, a high fat content to those seeds to add to the uh, food source for our birds and the wildlife there. So we think about it differently. And again, it goes back to thinking like a plant community. We want to think like a plant community and we want to think successionally, no matter where we at in the landscape. All right. What are the biggest challenges for establishing ironweed, and what tips do you have? Well, that's a good, that's a great question. So ironweed, it likes it fairly wet, and uh, so you know you see where it grows at naturally. And again, it goes back to mimicry. Uh, you see where it grows at naturally. It likes growing uh, wet waste areas uh, in roadside ditches and those type of things. So, uh, and, but it can take it dry, but not long periods of drought. So my best advice to, is using ironweed is to find some sort of low depressional area uh, where it can stay fairly wet or hold water for a certain period of time, uh, maybe a day or so or half a day, uh, where it's just uh, and that's the best place 
to put that plant is where it's going to stay damp or moist uh, and take advantage of that uh, low lying area. Uh, and it really likes to grow along the edges. Uh, again, uh, those ecotone areas, again, where, it's, where the moisture is going to hang longer. Uh, so there's also that uh, there's a dwarf iron weed there as well that we really like a lot. It doesn't get six or eight feet tall. Uh, but ironweed is a host plant for the butterflies and is attractive to butterflies. I tell you what, there's not many of them that hold candle to it. It's really a great plant. All right. The next question is about that steep slope along the lake. And the question is, is that Aragrastus? And if so, how far north have you had success with that plant? It, it, it is an Aragrossus in there. Uh, Aragrossus spectabilis, uh, what that plant is. We also had some uh, another plant in there that's very similar to it. It's uh, pink muligrass, a Muhlenbergia capillaris, uh, which is uh, a, a southeastern plant, grows along the coastal plain. Uh, but we, we're here in the upstate of North, uh, South Carolina. We're in zone eight. Uh, and which keep, the zones keep changing, <laughs> so it's climate change. But uh, but we have found that that these grasses as far north as we've been able to get them is up and up in the Raleigh uh, area and on up in I'd say uh, at least in the D.C. And uh, so, but I think you'll find these plants all along the eastern seaboard. It's if, if not Aragrossus spectabilis, but it's probably another Aragrossus. I'm not don't know the next specific thing right off, but uh, other types of Aragrossus and things that could work in a more uh, cooler climate uh, in, a, in the north. So, uh, but uh, I'd say at least as far as up as the Raleigh-Durham area, because again, that where the Piedmont, uh, the Piedmont goes all the way up to Raleigh-Durham. And uh, so again, these Piedmont, uh, these coastal plain ecosystems uh, there, and it was the foothills and mountains uh, can harbor that species very well. Very good. Do you have any suggestions for amending planting beds where a university campus in Maryland is trying to transition from annuals to perennials? Yes, very good question. Again, uh, great question, everyone. Um, I would say the best way to amend beds is again uh, is getting as much organic matter in there as you can, uh, you know, and without overly mulching it. I think mulch has got, uh, uh, the, the mulch issue is uh, one that's always been there for me. Uh, it's always been a problem uh, with me because of its, its chemical composition uh, and the way it breaks down, et cetera. But, you know, getting some good organic topsoil is the first thing in there. If you have an area that's uh, like, uh, um, that hasn't been disturbed and you have a, like what I call original soils where you have a, a, a what we call a, a soil horizon. Uh, you have an O horizon, A horizon, a B horizon, and a C horizon. Well, most of your living things are going to be in O, A, and B. So when you take a tiller, when you say, if you take a tiller to it, uh, and we just do not like till if we do not have to. And uh, so if you take a tiller to it, you're really destroying O, A, and B. And so, and you're exposing any living organisms in O, A, and B to sunlight. And with sunlight, it's going to kill those guys. And uh, so you're really taking a really big step backwards uh, as far as the uh, microorganisms that you need in your soil to make it alive. And this is where I was going to for in part of the talk is about the tropic level of things that we have to pay attention to. And it's the tropic level in the soils. What are the, what are the organisms, detritus organisms that make that soil alive? And then what are those life cycles in that soil? So you have to think of it in these terms. And so one, I would say add an organic topsoil and work that topsoil in through maybe some tiny forks where you kind of jab some holes into the soil and those organic soils go down into that compaction. To, and then the organism themselves have to break that up and keep that soil loose and friable uh, for your plantings. But again, the most important thing is add mycorrhizal fungi, you know, both endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi. And you can buy those fungi at a place called uh, bio, bio-plex.com. Uh, they make uh, products that have both endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi in them. And those particular one, 
One of them is for woody material and one is for perennial material. But I buy the product that has both in it, so I don't have to guess about it. Uh, so, uh, but you put that in your soil and put that in there where you can put it in the hole, each hole within each individual plant. Uh, you don't broadcast it, it has to go in the ground. And uh, so, but you put it in the hole with your plants and your plants just take off. And uh, it's really Jesus in a bag. It makes things grow. And again, as I mentioned, we hired a mycologist to come work for us at Earth Design here. You know, and we've really expanded our palette of mycorrhizal type things that we can work with to make our landscapes go. Because again, it comes back to understanding the trophic levels of the soil as well as everything else. So uh, that's the approach that we take. And uh, so from not just from the plants, but from the soil. And uh, I had to, I taught soil science for a while. Uh, for And so that background in soil ecology, soil ecology and, and, and Plant, uh, plant ecology center. It just made me have a unique perspective on how to make that work. Great, great advice. Uh, the next is: Do you have a suggestion for a nursery in the Delaware area that could supply native rhododendron and calmias? No, uh, I don't. I'm not up that far up, but I can tell you there's a there's, there's a Carolina nursery, which is uh, down in, uh, that d does a lot of uh, moving material up and down the eastern seaboard. They're called Carolina uh, Carolina Natives uh, Nursery, and they're out of Burnsville, North Carolina, and they grow wonderful rhododendron and mountain laurel and native azaleas uh, there, and good quality plants, and they do ship all across the eastern seaboard. Uh, and there's also another another nursery called Southeastern Natives uh, that do a lot of movement of plant material all across the eastern seaboard. And they grow some things, not just in the uh, calmias and roadie uh, palette, but also in some of our deciduous magnolias and uh, and pawpaws and things like that that normally people don't carry. And and they've been growing some things for me that I've got uh, like the things uh, on the Blue Ridge Parkway, like. Uh, uh, a plant called bush honeysuckle, which is a diarabella sesifolia, that we've recently got that out in the trade. You can talk about a beautiful plant. I mean, this plant is absolutely wonderful. And, you know, and it's a parkway endemic. Um, and so we brought it down down the hill uh, in our warmer environment, and it's done well. So I imagine it will move north as, equally as well because uh, it likes a cooler uh, elevation up there. And uh, But uh, those are just some good good thinking there. There's a lot of good uh, information on the website on the website to find these folks, vendors, I guess, if you will. Uh, and having been in the business for over 25 years, you know, it is supply and demand. You have to have the demand to get the supply. So, you know, the more people designing, the more people creating, the more people talking about it, the more people demanding uh, these, these uh, plants, uh, the more successful you'll be having local vendors in your area. Excellent. And we've had a listener suggest Adkins, A-D-K-I-N-S, Arboretum in Maryland. Uh, Kim says that they have a great selection of Delmarva natives. Great, great, great. Good tip. Good tip. Uh, the next question, do you have a resource that you recommend for recreating specific habitats? Um, maybe a little clarification on that question. So they're looking for recreating things such as local plant communities, forest edges, various types, uh, and what what resource they might look to for what plant, plant communities they could start. Right. Well, uh, I start off with some some books. Uh, I think they are very helpful. Uh, that there's a new book out by Claudia West and Thomas Rainer called uh, Planting, Planting in a Postmodern World. Uh, that is an excellent book there uh, to kind of give you some guidelines about plant communities and how to establish plant community things. Uh, there's another book called uh, uh, Native Landscaping with uh, um, Landscaping with Native Plants uh, in the Southeast by uh, Sally and Andy Wasowski. 
Uh, that is an excellent book because it shows you about companion plants and how plants work well, to, what plants work well together in the community uh, sense. Uh, so those are a couple of good books out there uh, that can help you uh, put some things together. Uh, but um, and then uh, of course you know there's some things that um, I'm trying to think here uh, some other resources. Uh, um, there's there's some great things out there on on the web as well about plant community design uh, out there. And I'm working on a book right now. <laughs> so pat that out. <laughs> Maybe sometime soon about you know how to use applied ecology and landscape communities to solve uh, landscape issues. So, uh, but those are a few resources that I know of out there that can help you with that. Uh, some of the more uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Wildflowers of South Carolina. Uh, but even even though it's South Carolina, these plants go all up and down the eastern seaboard, and uh, it's, uh, Wildflowers of South Carolina is based. Uh, the book is broken down as plant communities, so it's already broken down into communities. So in uh, for you, so that's a good source as well. And uh, so I know these may be a little bit more locally down here thinking, uh, but I think again, if you're on the eastern seaboard, plants up north and down here, there's a lot of similarities more than you would think. Uh, and again, with uh, with climate change, we're seeing a lot of southern plants move north. And uh, so I'm already seeing some plants that already moved as much as 500 miles in three years. And uh, plants we used to only see on the grower on the Barrier Islands now are growing up here in the upstate. And that's never happened before. <laughs> so, but uh, there's a lot of good resources out there. I didn't answer that very well, but uh, again, kind of gave you what I had. So. All right, we're going to finish up with one last question. And that is, what public gardens can you recommend to showcase all of the great diversity in your area? Well, I think the South Carolina Botanical Garden at, uh, at Clemson University is a great resource, a wonderful resource. Uh, that garden over there, uh, the curator of the, of the over there now is Dr. Patrick McMillan, and uh, and he has a, a, a TV show that uh, that uh, called Expeditions, and you'll find the garden there being showcased on his show Expeditions, as well as his travels all across the Southeast. Northeast and the world showcasing native plants and ecosystems. So if you haven't seen his uh, his uh, work on expeditions, uh, that's a great resource. And uh, so, uh, but the South Carolina Town Garden is a one place to see, you know, local gardens that uh, have performed well. The Pickens County Museum is the one I showed in the pictures there earlier. That's a, a landscape that, again, based upon uh, plant communities. Uh, thereof and so that one is a great resource as well as far as public gardens and uh and of course uh if you go to our website earth design uh you see the uh, uh www.earthdesignsc.com you'll see lots of landscapes that we've done over the years where we've applied ecology and plant communities uh we do this on on a residential scale uh, about 70 percent of our work is residential so you see how to take it down from a, a larger garden sense or landscape sent down to a small scale and uh, most people don't have 20 acres they've got a, 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 a backyard. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and sharing all of this just very inspiring information and we will definitely look forward to the release of your book soon we hope. <laughs> yeah I gotta, I gotta slow down and work on it. So. so thank you for participating good day and good gardening to you all. Thanks.